He's a polarizing figure, but you can't say he's not creative, and you can't say he's not willing to take risks. After about a half decade of roaming a vast musical landscape sampling all sorts of different sounds and styles, MGK returns to his hip-hop roots with his song, Don't Let Me Go. Let's talk about it. What's up guys, I'm Connor, and welcome to the Songwriter Sanctuary. So today I'm test driving a brand new series where I give you very short breakdowns of songs that I like. I've done a number of different song breakdowns in the past, but they're all very expansive, like some of them are 15 to 20 minutes. They just take a long time to research, they're very deep dives, and I wanted a series where I could churn out videos a little more quickly, and help songwriters just very quickly pick apart what's important in songs, so that they can begin applying those principles to their songwriting right away. So what we're gonna do here is in these videos, I'm gonna try to boil everything down to just six minutes, and since the clock is already running, let's get into it. So first, let's talk about the lyrics of the song. This song is basically MGK just opening up about his depression and mental health struggles. And it's deep, and it's dark, and it's raw, and I mean, he opens the song with a line about, well, Laid in the bed thinking maybe that hate will finally go away if I'm not alive. The entire song feels like a cry for help, and on a number of occasions, he actually breaks the fourth wall and addresses the listener directly, referencing what he's been doing with his music the whole time. I swear I've been telling you over and over again in all of these songs. He also addresses events in his life that are public, because he's a public figure, things that people know about. Not too long before the song came out, some photos and videos were released of MGK with his entire upper half of his torso and arms just covered in blackout tattoos, covering up all of his old artwork. And he addresses that here. I had a breakdown and tatted my entire body except one line. He also addresses his relationship with Megan Fox, or more specifically, the very tragic miscarriage of their child. How can I live with the fact that my hand was on a stomach when we lost the baby? Peppered throughout the song is little pieces of affirmations and bits of hope, but they don't really feel genuine. I'm coming back, don't let me go. They feel like he's saying them just because he feels like he's supposed to say them. Everything's just fine. And that line, I'm coming back, don't let me go, is also important. It's the tail end of the chorus. And he says it after he says three times, I'm coming back, just let me go. This is a little bit of an inside look into the mind of somebody dealing with depression. I can only speak from personal experience here, but when I was at my most low, there was a part of me that wanted help, and then another part of me that just wanted to push everybody away so I could get through it myself and not burden anybody else with my troubles. You see a lot of MGK trying to solve it himself in this song. You see him picking apart pieces of his past trying to figure out why he feels this way, and what might have happened to him to lead to this dark mental state he's in. He references a lifetime of bottling up his feelings and his emotions. I got trust issues growing up, no one was there to hear what I thought. And he also, at various points, references the tumultuous relationship he had with his parents. My heart was broken like my ribs as a kid, with me and my father fought. The chord progression of the song is very simple, but helps reinforce these feelings. The song is built entirely on just two major chords alternating back and forth. It's the four chord and the five chord in the key of E flat. This is an interesting choice because the song is so sad and so dark and so raw. And you wouldn't think that two major chords could convey that emotion. Major chords are supposed to be happy. But because the chord progression avoids going to the one chord, there's a lack of resolution. The four and the five going back and forth feels like a perpetual question mark. And between the tempo and the very sparse, haunting piano part that holds this chord progression down, it ends up feeling much more melancholic than you'd expect. The melody's kind of fascinating too. He does this thing that a lot of modern hip-hop slash pop artists do, where they sort of rap sing. He is singing a melody, but it's very constrained and the focus is more on the rhythm than the melody notes. In fact, the entire melody, every single note he sings in the entire song, can be boiled down to just three notes. It's the one, the two, and the three in the key of E-flat. And he only really does two things with this melody. He either sits on the two, Late in the bed thinking maybe that hate will finally go away if I'm not alive. Or he descends from the three to the one, sometimes moving back up briefly, but ultimately landing down on the tonic. Slipping again, there I go slipping again, I'm acting different again. It's simple, you could argue it's too simple, but it works. The emotion in his voice and the rhythm is enough to carry the melody completely. He doesn't need crazy jumps in his vocals, doesn't need to go outside the key, doesn't need any more than three notes in the scale to get his point across. There's also moments that feel much more real and raw because he slips out of singing and into a more conversational flow. It's funny, cause if we just sat and talked, 
The production of the song is also very simple. It's primarily built around that piano part that I mentioned earlier. And the other mainstay component is a percussion groove that's designed to sound like tapping pens on a desk. It's sort of an homage to the lunch table freestyle trope. Kids that are learning how to rap and freestyle and design lyrics by rapping over beats that are just tapped on a lunch table by their friends. There's a few other elements as well. There's two bass parts. There's an 808 bass that you hear through most of the song. And then there's a saw bass that comes in at very specific moments. Let me go. A fun thing that happens in the song is MGK breaking the fourth wall and addressing his producer, telling his producer to bring in the beat right before the 808 drops. Just let him bring the beat in. Before my dad left the surf. It's reminiscent of some early Eminem stuff. I have no snare in my headphones. The vocals are mostly left alone. Again, the emotion of his voice kind of carries the song on its own. But there are smatterings of vocal effects, some layered octaves, just little bits and bobs of ear candy mixed in. All in all, the song is super simple, but it's heartfelt, it's raw, it's vulnerable, and for a guy like me who loves sad music, it's everything that I would want in a song. I think it's a great example of an artist just directly opening up about their flaws and their struggles without too much fluff or grandeur. But beyond all that, beyond the specific elements of the song or how I feel about it, Mostly I just hope that MGK is okay. That's all we got. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you enjoyed this breakdown, and I'll see you in the next one.